Hello everyone. In this set of videos, we're going to be talking about nonlinear functional forms in regressions. The regressions that we've run up to this point have all had a linear form, whether they were simple regressions or multiple regressions. In these videos, I'm going to show you how to incorporate some nonlinear functional forms into regressions. This is going to allow us to build a lot more nuance into our regressions without actually making things much more complex in terms of actually running the regressions. We are going to have to be thinking a little bit more carefully about how we interpret our results. We'll be covering two different types of nonlinear functional forms, logarithmic and polynomial. In this video, I'm going to introduce the logarithmic functional form. Logarithmic functional forms are very popular in econometrics and regression analysis in general because of the very nice and convenient interpretation. Logarithms allow us to measure percentage changes with our regressions as opposed to the absolute changes that we are limited to with our linear forms. When we look at business and economic data, percentage changes are often a more realistic way to look at things. Before we get into the regressions, we need to talk about what is a logarithm, or a log for short. Whenever I say the word log, really what I mean is natural logarithm. In Excel, you can calculate natural logarithms using the function ln. Mathematically, the log function is the inverse of the exponential function. That's exp in Excel. The exponential function is e to the power of x. e here is just a number, approximately 2.7. Log of x tells us the exponent that is needed for the exponential function to equal x. So for example, log of 5 is 1.609. The reason for that is that e to the 1.609 power is 5. Notice that when two functions are inverses of each other, they can be used to undo the effects of the other. So while the log of 5 is 1.609, the exponential of 1.609 is 5. Much like how dividing and multiplying by 5 are inverses of each other. The graph of the exponential function looks like this, and if you can think about what the inverse would be, taking the mirror image of that, we would get the log graph. There are a few special properties of the log that are worth knowing. First, the log of 1 is 0. Why is that? Well, because e to the 0 is 1, just as any number to the 0 power is 1. And if we look on our graph, we can see that at 1, this corresponds with a value of 0. Similarly, log of e is 1, because e to the first power is e. If we go back to our graph, we can look at approximately 2.7, and you can see that that lines up with a value of 1. Now the log is also undefined for negative x's. The reason for that is that e is a positive number, and no matter what power you take e to, you're never going to get a negative number. So the log function is undefined for negative values. Likewise, the log of 0 is also undefined. Again, because e is a positive number, e to any power could never be 0. If we look at values of x getting smaller and smaller and smaller, closer and closer to zero, then what we get is an asymptote. You can see how as x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the value of the log of x starts plummeting down into the negatives. x can never reach zero, but as x gets smaller, it gets more and more negative. It's also worth remembering two of our standard log rules that apply here. The log of x times y is the sum of log of x and log of y, and the log of x to the c power equals c times the log of x. We're going to be using those two rules later on. Now that we have the basics down, let's talk about how we can apply logs to regressions. Previously, we have talked about only linear functional forms, such as the one here, y equals beta naught plus beta 1x plus epsilon. The interpretation of this equation is, for every unit increase in x, y changes by beta 1. It does not matter what the value of x is, that change is always going to be beta 1. This could be realistic for some situations, but for others, not so much. To motivate this, let's think about an example. Suppose that you had two different products, one where you increase the price from $1 to $2, and another one where you increase the price from $100 to $101. Do you think that these two price changes would have the same effect? The linear model, y equals beta naught plus beta 1x, assumes that they would be the same. 
Since each of these are $1 changes, it's going to change the sales by beta 1 no matter which of these situations you're in. But let's reframe these. $1 change from 1 to 2 is a 100% increase, whereas from 100 to 101, that's only a 1% increase. So even though it's the same absolute change, it's a much different percentage change. The log model allows us to look at percentage changes as opposed to absolute changes, which as you can see, a lot of times is much more intuitive. To incorporate logs into the model, we are simply going to take the natural logarithm of our variables. Let's keep things simple right now with just a simple regression, meaning we have y on the left-hand side and just one explanatory variable, which we will call x. We could take the log of y, we could take the log of x, neither or both. This gives us four different combinations depending on which variable we're going to take the log of. If we don't use any logs at all, that's what we call the level-level model, simply taking a regression of y on x. This is what we've been doing up to this point, and that is the equation that I showed earlier. This interpretation is simply increasing x by 1 accompanies a change of y of beta. Next, if we take the log of x, but not y, we have what we call a level log model. Whenever we have logs in an equation, the percentage change interpretation will always be on the variable that has the log, and the absolute change will be interpreted on the variable without a log. So if we regress y on the log of x in the level log model, we have a 1% increase in x, which accompanies a change of y of beta divided by 100. Notice that this is not a percent, this is just a number. So you might be wondering, why do we divide by 100? The reason for that is that 1% is actually 1 hundredth, or 0 0.01. So if we're going to convert things from a percent on the right-hand side over to not a percent on the left-hand side, we're going to need to divide by 100. Moving on to the log level model, this is when we regress the log of y on the left-hand side on just x, no logs, on the right-hand side. We're now going to have to flip our interpretation because now x is in levels and y is in logs. So we have a percentage change interpretation on y this time. So increasing x by 1 accompanies a 100 times beta percent change in y. Why do we have to multiply by 100? Well, because now we're moving from levels on the right to percentages on the left. So to go from not percents to percents, again, we're going to have to multiply by 100 this time. Finally, what happens when we have a log of both y and x? Then we have the log-log model. Here we have logs on both variables, so we have percentage change interpretations on both. So a 1% increase in x accompanies a beta percent change in y. We do not have to multiply or divide anything by 100 because we're in percents on both sides. These four combinations give us all the different options available to interpret our model. Which one of these you end up selecting for your regression is going to depend on the situation that you're in. Before we move on, I want to talk a little bit about why logs tell us about percentage changes. Suppose we have a variable x and we make a small change to x, delta. When delta is sufficiently small, the log of x plus delta minus the log of x is approximately delta over x. The change divided by the original value is how we calculate a percentage change. I mentioned that this works for small deltas, and the smaller the delta we have, the better the approximation is. So in this table, I have done the math and calculated 1% changes, 2% changes, and then approximated that using a log. You can see that for a 1% change, we have a difference of 0 0.00995, just shy of 1%. And as the percentage change gets bigger, the approximation continues to be pretty good, although it starts to depart further and further away from the true value that we're after. By the time we get down to 10%, you can see we're about half a percentage point off. And by the time we get to 20%, we are nearly two percentage points off. Keep in mind that this approximation is very good for small deltas, but as the delta gets bigger, then the approximation is going to be a little bit less reliable. Let's briefly go back to the property of the natural logarithm that it is undefined for values of x that are less than or equal to zero. This is a very practical consequence when we're working with data. If we want to take the log of a variable, we can't do that if we have certain values of that variable that are zero or negative. 
There's nothing we can really do about the negative values, but there is one little trick that we can use if we have values that are zero. If you have a variable that can either be zero or positive, no negative numbers, then what we can do is simply add one to the variable and then take the log. What this does is makes all the zeros into ones, and then of course also increases everything else by one. Now when we take the log of all those values that used to be zero, we're taking the log of one, which is going to be zero, and is no longer undefined. As long as our x's are mostly large numbers, adding one does not really affect things. So for example, if we have a variable that is income, we'll have many people with zero income because they don't work, but most people have an income in the tens of thousands, and adding one dollar to that does basically nothing. The last thing I want to talk about here is whether or not we have violated the OLS assumptions that we discussed in the last set of regression videos. One of our assumptions for causality was to assume that the determining function has a linear form, that is, it looks like a regression, beta naught plus beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2 and so on. Now that we have logs thrown in here, does that mess this up? And the great thing about it is no. Our equation is still linear in terms. All we've done is define one or more of our x's using a log. This assumption says nothing about how our x's are calculated, it's just once we've taken the log, it's going to go in in a linear way.